The Know Your Gear podcast is not responsible for any spontaneous guitar purchases you make during or after the show. The Know Your Gear podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 351 of the Know Your Gear podcast. And uh, thank you guys for joining. That's a, it's, a, it's, it's a nice thing to look forward to every Friday. Uh, busy week this week. Lots of cool things. Lots of interesting things to talk about. But more importantly, uh, I have some early questions that I grabbed. We get questions sent to the website. Um, just a reminder, if you guys are listening to this when it's uh, streaming or if you watch it you know, on YouTube, um, if you go to knowyourgearpodcast.com, you can submit a question. And if you know we see it and we think it sounds interesting, we grab it. So you never know what's going to grab my attention at the right moment, at the right time, and uh, we'll talk about it. But what's nice is if you do send one, like I said, don't be afraid to send another one if you don't see it getting read or talked about on the show. Also, keep mind we do put them in folders and sometimes i pull from them um not only on these shows but sometimes when we have to do the pre-recorded because something came up that week and i'm going to be out of town or something we do a pre-recorded and that's where i pull a lot of those questions so uh so there you go plus obviously from the patron and the member communities okay so so many things to talk about i hope uh you guys are ready for guitar talk Let's let's just jump into it. I like it when the show just jumps and moves fast. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about is the very first question I saw. Um, actually, the very first question I saw was the super chat. So it's already pinned up. But second question I saw was from Bruce, who says, "Hey Phil, is there any reason to be concerned about leaving a quality guitar tuned up to open E? I have read there is okay, and I have seen the recommendation to tune down to D, but I prefer open E. Um, it depends on the guitar. Okay." And I say that mostly, uh, I'm going to just say that I don't think you have to worry about that. I think you can leave a guitar in tune, uh, shipped, and we're talking about electric guitars, okay? So this is where information gets confusing. So let me see if I can break it down. First, let's just for this question, break some guitars down into a couple sections. Classical style guitars that don't have a truss rod acoustic guitars of all natures, whether they're 12 strings or six string acoustic guitars, but acoustic guitars in particular. And then we're gonna say electric guitars. That's another, That's definitely a category. So those are three big categories. And then we're gonna say early, early uh, inexpensive guitars that um, sometimes ha don't have truss rods because they're from a long, long time ago and a galaxy far away. Uh, Sears and Roebuck catalog, uh, catalog, catalog guitars, we'll say, and other guitars like that, okay? So let's just say that's four pretty good categories. Information gets crossed all the time, okay? A modern electric guitar, when I say modern, I mean definitely within the last 30 years, okay? <laughs> okay, definitely 30, extremely guaranteed for 20 years, you know, 20 years from back, you know, uh, so um, back to 2004, okay? Um, and pretty much all the guitars from the 50s, 60s, and 70s too, but just for the most part, that's what I want you to concern with. Those truss rods are strong enough and the guitars were built well enough that they're going to hold a tune for everything from shipping to sitting in the closet to sitting in a case, you name it. Down tuning the guitars can can be helpful, but here's the kicker. It could be also detrimental to the guitar. So since you don't know, and every case is uh, separate, I, I always tell you what I would do. I just keep my guitars tuned up wherever they are, wherever they go, wherever they ship. Um, there are maybe a couple concerns with, you know, Gibson headstocks, you know, because if they get banged. I have a video called... Um, um, it's myths, myths, <laughs> I always have this trouble, myths with the TH that guitar players believe are true. And uh, in that video, which it did a million views or something like that, um, probably because of what I'm about to tell you, I just took my one of my favorite Les Pauls and I tried to break the neck by pushing on it with a moderate amount of force, okay? And um, so what I did was I, I did that and I showed how hard you have to flex the, the neck and it still didn't crack, obviously, or break. So it's not... It's not hard to break a, a, a Gibson style headstock off. It's just not as easy as it's just tuned up sitting in a case, okay? It needs impact. It needs something else. It needs an outside, uh, you know, variable. So um, so anyways, the important part of this is I would tune your guitar. However, there's these are the exceptions. Like I said, acoustic guitars are an exception. Sometimes it's a good idea to down tune them. Down -tune them. has nothing to do with the neck. 
Okay, it has to do with the top of the guitar and the bridge on the guitar and just the pressure. So um, acoustic guitar manufacturers are known, some are known to ship acoustic guitars and down tune them, store them down tuned and humidified. That is common. It happens. So there's a, a thing. Same with classical guitars, although the tension on a classical guitar is usually not that strong because of the nylon strings. But um, another thing that's also important to think about is 12 string guitars and whether that be electric or acoustic maybe down tuning those and in fact in fact a lot of manufacturers i haven't seen it in recent years but a lot of manufacturers used to do this which was creepy they would print warranty paperwork for 12 string acoustic guitars primarily acoustic and say that if you tune the guitar to standard E, you would vo void the warranty. Probably right now, people are like probably scoffing at me. It's absolutely true. <laughs> I remember, so it's absolutely true. Um, there was a reason why guitar players like Tom Petty um, played a Guild 12 string because Guild was known for making these 12 strings that you could just tune to pitch and stay in tune. Um, now this is the old Guild and. I can't tell you I'm familiar with the new brand or the new company that owns them and what kind of quality they're pumping out. But um, that's what Guild was known for back in the day was having these amazing 12 strings. In fact, you would see guitar players like Tom Petty and other guitar players that were uh, who would play Martins and and or even Taylors exclusively for every situation except for a 12 string. And so um, 12 strings are definitely something that, especially acoustics, I would say, if you're going to store them and keep them a long time, maybe maybe down tune those, a half step down or full step down, um, just because that's a lot of tension. So, uh, and I hope that helps. The main thing is don't over worry about it because like I said, if, if I hate to say this, if you tune your guitar to open E and in a few years, it's stored and it twists or, you know, the neck bows to where it can't be straightened back or whatever the problem is, you're probably going to have that problem if it wasn't tuned to pitch either. You know, I mean, in my experience, if the neck is right, the neck is right. It's really hard to make that neck uh, do something it doesn't want to do. If it is a strong piece of wood, it's cut correctly, dried correctly, and then it has a truss rod in it. It's almost, like I said, it's strings are just no match. <laughs> They're just no match. Um so there you go. I hope that helps. Uh, I see a lot of uh, people talking about the swirl. Let me show you the swirl. Let's let's do that. We'll we'll do the swirl. Okay. So got to remember not to talk because I'm away from the microphone. Okay. So I got my Kiesel swirl. If you guys uh, followed me on social media, I apologize. No, if you followed social media um, a few months ago, I think it was November. Uh, Kiesel announced that they were doing swirls again. And this is the swirl I call the paw, the passion warfare swirl. And um, even though it's mostly black. And so this is a dipped guitar, absolutely gorgeous. My understanding is they were gonna do 50 of each color, 50 of these, but I think they ended up doing 50 something, 54. And so you are, for the record, so no one gets all their underwear in a bunch. They didn't announce they were only doing 50. They didn't say it was only 50. They said they're, they just weren't doing a lot. But I heard later passively that it was 50 something. So these are all dipped. Jeff Kiesel dipped each one. So as you guys know, I've, I've been wanting a BC Rich Gunslinger for a long time. You know, that kind of pointy headstock, reverse headstock. Of course, I always wanted a seven string universe. And um, this guitar, although expensive, was a fraction of the price of both those guitars. Fraction. <laughs> um, so uh, again, not inexpensive, but I'd like to say it was half the price of those guitars. It was 25% the cost of either one of those guitars uh, that I, if I would've got one. So what did I do? I did the diamond inlays like Beast Rich used to do. So I've got the green dot diamond inlays. I got a hip shot bridge. One of the patrons asked me why I went hip shot and not Goto. I like the Goto for the more vintage feel and I like the hip shot for more of a Floyd Rose feel. Why didn't I go Floyd Rose? I didn't want to do Floyd Rose because I like to drop D tune a lot and um, I don't want to pull that little thing here. It's just easy for me to just twist the tuning key. Um, so, and then of course they, let me just show this thing. They dipped the headstock and then I went with uh, the Kiesel pickups in, in the green. Uh, I could have sent them pickups, but you know, I like their pickups uh, very fine. Um, and then I did maple neck mahogany body in hopes to save some weight. It didn't save too much weight. This was eight pounds, one ounce or two ounces. So it's not super light, but it's just perfect for me. Uh, anything in about eight and a half pounds or higher, I'm just not in love with it. Uh, I did ebony fretboard with jumbo uh, stainless steel frets to give it that more 80s feel, 12 inch radius. So essentially I just mocked up a a gunslinger, but with obviously two pickups instead of one. I was gonna go one pickup, I could have done that. But then I thought, 
uh, you know, screw it. <laughs> I'm not playing 80 shred music. I just want the look. And uh, it came out great. Um, there's one on reverb right now. Somebody bought one as a seven string, and I guess they're immediately flipping it. And, and their swirl came out a little better than mine. Swirls are just luck of the draw, but this one's good. It's not as colorful. It's got a lot more black on it, but it makes the pickups pop. I mean, I'm happy. Let's just say that. I'm happy. Uh, and uh, if you ordered one, I, my understanding is you're getting yours soon, too. So, you know, I I am uh, I do have arrangements with Kiesel, and I've talked about this in the past, where they'll sometimes fast-track a guitar for me. Uh, and um, that is not what happened in this case. So if you're waiting for one of these and you didn't get yours yet, it's either because uh, you're farther away <laughs> towards the East Coast than me, or there's something on your guitar. And that's a little trick with Kiesel I've learned. Uh, that if you order certain things, like for instance, if I would order a Godot bridge instead of the hip shot, that would slow down the process, right? There's certain things that can slow down the process of a guitar, uh, just things you order, things you request. If you change one little detail, it could could add a few days or a week to the timeline on it. But um, so, so let's just say I didn't get mine fast track. So if you see your mine here and you ordered one too and you're waiting for yours, my guess is you're probably a week out tops, depending on whatever you chose that's hanging it up. But uh, there you go. So like I said, they didn't they didn't do anything um, super like they didn't accommodate me except for and again because I always uh, disclose everything. Um, I went to buy this at full price and they did give me a smoking deal. Um, so there you go. And in fact, I even told that story on the show and I'll tell it again, which is they flat out told me that um, because these are painted or dipped by Jeff and it's his personal work. They just couldn't comp me one, which I totally understood. I didn't ask for that. And they said, hey, if you want an Aries, we'll build you an Aries. We'll ship it to you, you know, and 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 uh, no problem. But if you want this one, you know, you got to pay. And I go, okay. So they gave me a really, really great deal. And when I talked about the guitar being 25% of the price of those other two dream guitars of mine, uh, I don't mean with a deal. <laughs> I mean, if I paid the full price. If you're curious what the full price on this was, this guitar was spec'd out to be about twenty-four dollars to $2,600, uh, which is... Quite a bit of money, but uh, a gunslinger in a solid uh, color right now is about four thousand dollars. And uh, a gym, or not gym, uh, a universe. If you can find one, they're about eight grand. So there you go. And if you want to be rich, if you want to be rich gunslinger in a crazy graphic or something crazy like that, then it's about six thousand. So quite a bit of money. So, but dream, dream comes true. Sure. For sure it's one of those one of those cool guitars all right uh i hope that was nice the show and tell thing okay so um second question right is there a second question two five one says uh filiberto question for you i am trying out sonic youth alternative tunings and i'm worried it might mess up the neck is that a valid concern i'm tuning up to low e the tuning up the low e to f sharp uh for example Okay, um, so, no, um, no, it, it shouldn't hurt anything. Uh, again, will you have to make an adjustment to this truss rod? It's possible. And again, you didn't tell me what kind of guitar. So, I mean, you know, think about this. I don't want to say inexpensive guitars are problematic, but obviously you understand that certain guitars are going, the neck is going to move more. For instance, and just so you know, it has nothing to do with price. On this wall behind me, if I was to do that tuning, I can tell you right now, if I do it on that Nags, I would not have to adjust the truss rod. It's not because Nags is super expensive. It's because that neck is pretty thick. And regardless of what's inside that neck, that neck just doesn't want to move. They they take the time to dry their neck. The Kiesels, I definitely would also because they're quarter sawn and, uh, they're, and this one's multi-laminate. That's a single piece of quarter sawn, so it's pretty strong. However, my PRS Mira, which is behind me, sorry guys, there, as I told you, that neck moves because, you know, <laughs> it's Thursday, and <laughs> it just moves. So that, if I did the tuning on that guitar, I would expect to uh, do the truss rod. And a little fun, uh, fun fact, I don't know if it's a fun fact, but if you're watching my videos, uh, <laughs> if you watch my videos, you can tell what guitars I'm doing alternate tunings to a lot, okay? And what guitars stay in tune the best by, wait for it, whether or not there's a truss rod cover on the neck. So what I mean by that, so keep in mind, my Delos does not have a truss rod cover because it has a truss rod delete. That is just because I said I just don't want the truss rod cover. However, this Paul Reed Smith S2, if you see it's missing the truss rod, it's because I have to adjust the neck. The mirror is missing the truss rod as well. Um, 
that Gibson, actually, I just put the truss rod back on it. <laughs> <laughs> our truss rod cover uh so you know so a lot of my guitars if you see the truss rod cover missing it's because i'm adjusting them uh, quite often i told this story a long time ago but it's funny uh gina prs she was watching one of the podcasts and she she very kindly messaged me and said hey phil i see you're missing a couple truss rod covers on your prs i'd like to send you a few out and i said oh gene thanks i have a pile of them in a drawer um i just leave them off because i have to adjust the necks all the time and not all my prs's just uh this s2 because i this is my tremani guitar this s2 that i'm single cut s2 uh and what i mean by that is if you ever look up alter bridge look up all those tunings every time i'm doing tunings alter bridge tunings that guitar is just getting abused to hell. So I don't want you to think that's a defective guitar has an issue. That guitar, the fact that it could do all that horrible stuff that I do to it is crazy. It is crazy. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. Fast Freddy says, hey, Phil, did you do the Firebird video yet? Um, well, it's not out yet, but the good news is if you watch this week, uh, videos this week, um, you notice I did a deep dive of the court guitar. It's right behind me, the X700 uh, triality guitar. Um, what's important about that video and the video previous deep dive previous to that is that is the new format with all the new cameras. Um, you guys might have noticed in that video that you can see one of the other cameras in shot. It's something that actually, I don't see myself as somebody with OCD, but I, it drives me nuts. But, um, the reason the can the room is set up the way it is, everything's set up the way it is, is that I was able to, uh, film a deep dive video in not quite half the time, but close to half the time it normally takes. So I can speed up the deep dives and now put them out in a faster pace. And that's what's happening right now. So the question is for those of you who are like, are you, when you're gonna do the video on this guitar, when you're gonna do this video, you're gonna start seeing them coming pretty rapidly now, as uh, you see this week, um, you know, I put out the two videos, you'll start seeing more video content weekly now, as I've kind of adapted. And it took a long time. It started in about October of last year, refining the rooms and the cameras and the process and what what will film be filmed what way and how it will get filmed and it's um i want i've been working really hard to speed up the process of how i do this without changing any of the quality uh of what the con of the contact contact context context i have no idea what the hell i'm saying anymore I'm trying not to take anything that you guys love away, right? I, mean, I wanna make the videos a little faster, but I don't want you to go, oh, I really miss that you used to do this. I don't wanna hear that. So everything is, uh, it's like all the ingredients are in there. I've just figured out how to speed up the process. Um, so there you go. Um, so I, I, I hope that hope that makes sense. So yes, videos like that soon coming, a lot of them coming actually, uh, and you'll see. Okay, um, I also saw a question comment from Rad Furry 23 who's a member, thank you, says, does Kiesel Headless, does your Kiesel Headless have a tremolo bridge? It does not. Uh, if so, do you have any opinions on the different models of the trim and the, for the headless guitars? Um, ironically, uh, uh, I did have a Strandberg with a tremolo I loved. It was green, I sold it to a patron. And because I bought the True Temperament, which does not have a tremolo. So this headless does not have a tremolo. My Delos headless, I opted for no tremolo. The reason I did no tremolo was even they were like, wait, I don't understand. You have a tremolo on your other one. Don't you want a tremolo on this? And I said, no, because I wanted it as light as possible. I was afraid that tremolo would add weight. Uh, I want to keep the guitar pretty light and this end up light. So my Delos headless doesn't have a trim just because when you're having a guitar built, there's certain things I can do to like, okay, this will lighten up the guitar a little bit if I don't put a brass, you know, heavy piece of metal in there. Um, so I don't currently have a headless with a tremolo is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so let's start with that. Um, uh, preference wise, I definitely prefer the hip shot uh, tremolo system. The uh, one that was on the ER guitar, I've tried a couple on other guitars off the Strandberg. Without a doubt, it's the hip shot system that I prefer the most. Um, but I'm not a huge tremolo on the headless guitars fan. I mean, they're fine. They get you there. But I, I'm more of just, I like headless guitars for their, and I, another thing I love, I love the tuning stability. So I kind of like knowing that it's, there's just nothing moving, nothing going on. So, okay. Um, uh, Susan said the court video was quite nice. Thank you for that. The um, interesting, I, I, I talked to my wife, I was telling her about this story. I wasn't sure if I wanted to talk about it. So I'm gonna talk about it. 
Um, and uh, it's interesting. So this comes up from time to time when I tell you guys that, you know, companies like sometimes get companies get mad at me or companies don't want to work with the channel. And people always say the same thing. They go, what, what do you, you don't say anything, Phil. You're so nice. I always say, that. so nice. What? And I go, you don't understand. You know, um, and I've mentioned in the past, I mentioned in the past that, uh, you know, companies that I don't even do product reviews for will send me either nasty emails or texts or call me sometimes. Everything from cease and desist letters from attorneys to, you know, uh, how could you? And I've told you guys in the past, I, I never tell you guys when it happens. And so when I refer to it back in the past, I, I don't want to talk about it because I'm like, what if the person who chewed me out doesn't work there anymore, doesn't run that company? And so this week, an interesting thing happened. And I want to tell you, not because I want to tell you guys, I want to hopefully help some of these companies who are contacting me. <laughs> okay. So I did a video on uh, the Music Nomad uh, safe file this week. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys saw it. If you haven't, you can check out the video. Um, what happened was on the WhatsApp, which is the patrons, ha the different tiers of patrons have WhatsApp, the top and middle tier. The top tier, I forget who, so I'm if they're watching, don't get mad at me because I don't remember which one of you guys brought it up, but one of them brought up this new thing. Hey, Phil, did you see the new safe file? And I saw it, and so I immediately bought one. And this is important because, uh, and I and I know this is gonna. I want to be very cautious how I talk because this kind of conversation can sound like I'm a one bitching, but two like a pity party. It's not neither one of those things. I'm really just want to make a point here, <laughs> okay? Uh, especially because I kind of look at you as the community, and and this is the you guys. I care about this community, so I just want you to understand wh why this is interesting to me. So I bought the tool. I. I, I've been upfront about the fact that Music Nomad in the past has sent me some stuff, including the fret or nut files. I have not done a video of the nut files. It's because I just don't know how I feel about them. There's things I like about them. There's things I dislike about them. But more importantly, um, it's not about that. It's it's uh, it's a product video where I have to do a, an educational thing where I just teach how to use them, and it's really what it's going to be. Um, so Music Nomad has sent me products in the past, and sometimes i've done a video of them and sometimes i haven't and uh, in in one particular case and again this kind of sucks because I, I really like the music nomad guys but this is what happened they um sent a product and we uh we meaning my wife and i told them we'd love to do the video we'd like you to sponsor it and i you know i have this great idea and i want to use the product in this video and i think it's going to do well and it works out great and it's very for lack of a better term synergy like this video needs this product in it. Why don't we make this happen? I, we sent them the video that we were interested in. We asked them for a few hundred dollars to sponsor the video. They uh, turned us down. We released the video anyways. I couldn't control us. It went viral and I got a million views. <laughs> okay, or whatever. I got a gazillion views. And so they get to reap the rewards of that. They got lots. Lo so in other words, I'm not, I'm just telling you guys where I stand on this stuff. So sometimes if the video, you know, the videos are for you guys, it's for us. So if it makes sense to make the video, and I only tell you this because you have to understand, everybody talks about sponsors and no sponsors. I just want you to understand that no matter how many views, I have hundreds of millions of views on this, on this platform. The best I can do on this platform, I can only make 10% of what a sponsor can pay. So if I make a video and I get a, 100,000 views or a million views, that pays 10% of what a sponsor would have paid. So I, you know, so you understand, sponsors are a big deal if, when it comes to work, I have to work. So that means that if you're doing the math, that means if I do 100,000 view and it pays me $100, I gotta make nine more videos to make what a sponsor would have paid for one video. So it's a lot of extra work. The reason I tell you all that is, is that <laughs> I bought this Music Nomad file, I did a video, it did cross my mind to say, hey, maybe they should sponsor this one. I was like, you know what, I've had it. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't wanna, um, I don't wanna talk to any companies about that stuff right now. I just wanna make the video. I, I love the product and I kinda feel like if I brought it up with them, there might be a problem with them trying, if I asked them to sponsor it, if, because I wanted to really highlight some Stu Mac products as well, because there's some products in there. I highlighted some multiple files that I like. And I go, this will kind of work. So I didn't want any compromise. The reason I share that with you has nothing to do with Music Nomad. <laughs> it nothing to do with Stu Mac. I didn't get one. I didn't get two. I got three nasty emails from three other companies, three other companies 
saying basically, how dare I highlight this company's product that it was stolen from them. By the way, all three of these companies, I hope you're watching this. None of you three know this, by the way. I didn't tell any one of you three that you're not the first or the second or fucking third to see me in an email saying, how dare you? <laughs> you know, whatever, right? Whatever you're pissed about. So they all basically claim Music Nomad ripped them off. By the way, if you're all, any of you are watching, there are other people not just you that think that they, they've been ripped off or they whatever so whatever you think you might want to go out legally and figure out what your uh, trademarks and patents are or what your uh what your optics are on your files um i know all three companies and people told me specifically that music nomad stole this from them but uh, apparently you all stole it from each other. I don't know what's going on, but here's what I thought was funny. I want to say, and I'm not, cause I'm not saying any of the company's names. They're all small companies, by the way. Um, one of which did send me a follow-up email after I basically told him that I don't understand why he's yelling at me, A, the potential customer in the future for him, B, a person who did an independent review, and C, just go yell at Music Nomad. I don't work for them. <laughs> but, um, the, he was nice enough to send me things saying yes. Okay, I couldn't read all of it. It was like five paragraphs long. So he basically said, yes, I see your point. I Yes, I was just upset. So to his credit. But what's funny about this is I'm sitting there going, the reason I'm talking about this is I don't want you to think that I'm irritated that this happened. What I want you to know is this happens one in every five videos. I have received some kind of fight pushback and it's always like this. It's how dare I highlight a, another product. I did a five things video. I won't even tell you which one because like I said, I won't talk about the ones in the past, but just so you guys know, I did a five things video, a uh, five things you don't know about a company. Their competitor called me. They were like, hey, I need to talk to you. That's, I got a message. I need to talk to you right now. And I was like, oh, great. They probably want to get highlighted on the channel too. And since I didn't get paid by the other company, maybe there's an opportunity, right? To get some sponsorship or maybe just get a highlighted product. Instead, I sat there for 30 minutes while they screamed at me about how I didn't mention their product one time in my video that was about another product. And I said, you know, I didn't, I just, I just liked that product and I bought one and I just thought I'd talk about it. So I tell you guys this because I think sometimes there's this naive, uh, and I, and sometimes the YouTube channels, including myself, we perpetuate this problem with companies don't care what I say, right? They just let me do whatever I want. And I tell you guys all the time, that's not true. Some companies get really pissed off. Um, and since we started with the negative, let me give you a positive. Court Guitars absolutely sponsored the X uh, 700, as you guys know, it's sitting here on loan from them. They sent it to me. They said, hey, Phil, would you like to check out our new guitar? I'd like to point out that's how it was presented to me. Hey, would you like to check out our new guitar we're leasing? I said, yes. Um, uh, they were. They watched the channel. As I told you guys, the owner of Court Guitars watches the podcast. They said, we know you like to spend time with the guitar. We'll get it to you two months early. So I've had it for two months um, before the video got released. And I would be lying if I didn't tell you I was scared to absolute death when I released the video that court was going to be furious that I said it looks like a Kiesel because it looks like a Kiesel. And there was a small part of me that thought Kiesel guitars might call me and say, I can't believe you're highlighting a guitar that's like a copy of ours. I'd like to point out now that court loved the video. They absolutely thanked me, asked me if they could even have some of the footage and, and highlight it. And uh, obviously Kiesel didn't have a problem either. And that is awesome, right? So that's why I said it's funny to me that it can go positive. So I want you to know the positive. That's a positive story. The negative is I just, and I also wanted to have this discussion. This is also what I'm going to send companies when they decide to light me up. I'm going to say, look, are you kidding? Go suck it. <laughs> so, uh, and I want to also point out why it's important to do independent reviews and videos as well. I mean, look, if I could do non-sponsored all the time, I would do them just sometimes, like I said, at a 10 to one multiplier, it's tough. It's tough. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing, but I'm, I've worked hard to keep it minimalized and keep control so that I can have a discussion like this one day where I'm like, if the companies don't like it, they can suck it. There you go. There you go. That'll probably make a bunch of them want to work with me. <laughs> Uh, we're going to laugh the rest of the show now. Okay, I got it off my shoulders. I, I feel better. I feel better. And to the companies that reach out to me, I would really do some research and find out because apparently a lot of you think you designed that file and you probably did, but I don't think you guys know about each other. All right. Um, let's go. Let's go to a, a better, happier subject. 
uh, as as we know. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, the next one. What's the next question? Um, okay, so. Uh, this is from Clyde. Clyde says, hey, Phil, if I needed to move some gear quickly, what would your strategy be? Well, uh, you know, first, I just, you know, again, to tell you guys, I, because I have this platform, it's a pretty easy strategy for me. I just unloaded an insane amount of gear and I all went to patron and there was a few things they didn't buy and I threw them on reverb. So, you know, so at that point it was pretty easy. I think the patrons bought like 14 of my guitars and maybe six or seven amps and, you know, a couple pedals and you know, some other stuff. So some pickups and things like that. So they, they bought a ton of that stuff. So it's nice to have a community is what I'm saying. So, you know, so first I would say, yeah, you probably don't have, you know, a weekly show with members to, <laughs> you know, to talk to and stuff, but you have friends. And I will tell you that that is something I do think of. I, I do a lot as well is especially if you have some cool, man, if you have cool stuff, always remember your friends. I send out and my friends sometimes, I think half of them probably don't like it when I do it, but I do it anyways. I send out a mass text. Uh, when I say mass, I don't like include each other on it, you know, but I send them all this, a list and I go, I'm getting rid of this stuff. Anyone interested? You get the friends and family pricing. And then if they say, yeah or nah, that's how it goes. And then after that, I give it to the patrons and they get friends and family pricing. And then I go to reverb and then it just goes to reverb. Um, so that is, so first your friends, right? I understand you might not have a lot of friend circles. I don't, don't feel bad. I don't have a whole lot of friends that play guitar either. You'd think I'd have way, way more than I do, but I don't. Um, and I personally, I just don't like Craigslist for the most part. I don't like meeting people in parking lots. Um, you know, I'll post from time to time on Craigslist. I think it's always to remind myself why I'm not enjoying it. Um, I've tried the uh, Facebook marketplace and all that stuff. Again, just not loving it. Haven't seen awesome results from that. Um, some, some, you know, your, you know, your mileage may vary. So some of you will probably had great experiences with that. Um, and I kind of go in it with a negative attitude, as you know, because I, I just said I don't want to meet people and hang out <laughs> in a parking lot. So I'm sure I'm like not being the best, uh, you know, not the best of that. Um, what I will tell you is if you have a lot of gear and you want to get rid of it, that's exactly a good time to talk to a music store. Um, and this is where, this is a great conversation I love having over the years. Everyone always says the same thing and, and they're not wrong, but I just want to make sure that I make my uh, thoughts clear. They'll say, oh, the stores give you nothing for it. But this is true, but not always because things are valued differently to different people. So as someone who's bought a lot of gear as a music store, I can tell you there's certain things that you probably couldn't give away to somebody on Reverb, but as a store, I would be eager to buy it. Um, in, in my store, because we did so many lessons, we had a huge problem keeping inexpensive used guitars in the store. It's almost like they were never there because we were always signing students every single day we saw we signed a student to the lesson academy so every single day there was a potential somebody's like i'm looking for a guitar and you know and and especially in our situation it was like you know 120 dollars for the month of lessons they didn't want to spend 500 dollars a guitar that day they want to spend like you have a guitar for like 100 bucks and 220 bucks i'm out the door and i'm like and so having some junky guitars i mean that in a very kind way uh you might offload them to a store very easily. Uh, same thing with pedals uh, sometimes are effective because the store might want the inventory. Um, the, the best way I've done it is you write down what you want for everything and then, but also focus on the total dollar amount you're trying to get and take it to a store and see what they'll take. And hopefully they'll take it all. And if they get you close to that dollar amount, the total dollar amount, I tend to not worry about the dollars and cents. Like I wanted $600 for this guitar. They only want to give me four, but on that guitar, I only wanted 300 and they're going to give me five. So, you know, Hey, I'm within tolerance. And then once they give you a total, um, you can play with that total a little bit, you know? So if it's a little far off and you're told, you can see if you ink, ink them up. Um, what I do tell you to stay away from is cherry picking. Okay. Um, that's where you'll get really screwed really fast. Uh, the, the, where you take, uh, let's say 10 guitars or whatever, and a couple amps to a store. And you know that four or five are just hitters, man. They're just great guitars. Everybody wants them like a Mexican made strat. It's like an easy sell, an Epiphone. Like everybody wants that. Right. Um, and, and they're like, yeah, we'll take the, we'll take these four and we'll give you that. And they're going to let you walk and you're walking out with all the stuff that, you know, it's going to be hard to sell. I wouldn't be eager to do that, but I also wouldn't say no and leave. That's an also great opportunity because they've already told you they really want the stuff, certain things. And again, think like a store. They're thinking like, I can sell that stuff pretty easy. 
we used to call it the tax. I mean, we did it with manufacturers too. Gibson, we call it the Gibson tax or, um, you know, Gibson, we're like, oh, you can carry our guitars, but you got to carry our pickups and all our other accessories too. So then we're like, oh, okay, it's the tax. Same thing with the trade-in. Sometimes you'd be like, man, these four guitars, we could sell those in a minute. In fact, if they're half a decent small store, <coughs> excuse me, guys, I have a mute button either and I'm not even using that. And I apologize. If they're half decent store, they already know who they're going to sell them to. I remember taking in trades and in my head, I'm like, I'm calling Dave. I'm calling Mike. I'm calling, right? Like I knew exactly as soon as the customer left, who was getting a phone call and who's coming to buy this stuff right now. So um, you might entice them by saying, okay, I really need to get rid of all this stuff. What do you give me for this little, the rest of the stuff? You know, make, a, make an offer and then see how close it is. That sometimes, and if you do come out a little bit, you know, like you don't make as much, um, sometimes it's worth it for your time and effort because that's one of the problems about big collections, man. Okay. Um, your collection can be a burden. It can be an albatross. It can be a boat anchor. And, um, you know, and the, and the reality of that is I can tell you, um, <laughs> I can tell you cause I know how I know what you can sell on average part time on reverb and craigslist um and what i mean by that is i know how many guitars you know i'm not talking about guys that are just focused every day wake up and flipping guitars all day i'm talking about you know you gotta you're an average joe or jane you got a 40 hour work week ahead of you you got some some yard to maintain or some stuff to do you know right go to the gym on a tuesday and uh you want to put some time into selling some gear. If you sell one guitar a week, you're doing great. Two, it's really great. Three, oh, you're pushing. So when you say you got 10 guitars, you either got to be realistic about the time frame it's going to take to unload this stuff, or you got to make um, some serious, uh, uh, you know, adjustments. But like I said, I wanted you guys, hopefully, and you guys have, thank you for letting me put out all my thoughts. The other thing you can do, which I've done very well. In fact, a friend who's a patron just benefited from this exact strategy was sometimes I go to a store and I'll go, what do you give me for this stuff? And they go, okay, we'll give you two grand for all the, you know, for this stuff. And we don't want this stuff. And I go, well, would you take it all? What would you give me for this? And they'll, they throw a number and maybe the number is way too low. They go, I'll give you 500 bucks, all that stuff. And let's say the number I want is like a thousand. And I'm like, wow, we're way off from each other. Um, I, I, I changed my strategy to trade, okay? I know the goal is to get rid of stuff, but if you can get rid of stuff that you don't want or that's hard to sell, more importantly, not the want, the hard to sell. Um, so for instance, I've done this a lot. I have a bunch of things. The store is kind of interested in it. I'll say, take all this stuff. They say, okay, okay. Um, but they only give me a number that I don't like. I'll go, I'll walk around and I look and I go, that's worth about fifteen hundred dollars i wonder if they'll straight trade it for me because they're probably not interested in it and see to me it's easier to sell or they have three things that i go i can easily sell these things because again you have friend circles and you're like oh my buddy dave will definitely buy this or i can definitely sell this on craigslist a little easier um, sometimes you have to make decisions with amps i've done this many times where i've traded amps for guitars because it's so much easier to sell a guitar and ship a guitar to, for me personally on reverb sometimes the best way to get out of amps is to trade an amp for a guitar. <laughs> and then sometimes I trade guitars for pedals because pedals are so easy to ship and so easy to unload. Um, even though it's more physical work, because now I'm going to sell 10 pedals on reverb versus two guitars. Just this, just how easy it is to make the fast flip of selling the pedal so fast. And also how easy it is to ship that pedal and not worry about the person going, Oh, I got damaged in freight. Cause if your pedal got damaged in freight, they were mad at your pedal. <laughs> okay. Cause pedals are, I mean, we step on them. So obviously stick them in a box. They should be fine. So those are some strategies on how to get rid of this stuff. And, and, um, there you go. I don't know. And then of course, I'm sure everybody else is going to have some, some, some thoughts too. Okay. Um, um, oh, okay. Now here's the funny story. So uh, the last part. Uh, so I had a patron that bought a, uh, something for me recently. I'm going to keep it vague. <laughs> and they go, oh, you sold it too cheap. And the irony was I sold it for a smoking deal. But I told him not to worry about it because I said I'm fine. And the reason I'm fine is because I had traded some stuff for that. And so I had doubled my money from what I traded. 
Now, I granted, I know I could get more, but my logic was I'm already doubling my money and this is an easy transaction. I don't need to make this more complicated. He gets the benefit. I get the benefit. Everybody wins. You know, um, you know, I like the don't get greedy kind of logic. Um, the um, So, you know, <laughs> and just to understand, it's not even about money. When I say don't get greedy, um, Nathan, uh, Ralph, um, Darren, everybody who's ever worked at my shop uh, with me or around me, knows don't get greedy. Uh, the don't get greedy is what I would say when they go, hey, Phil, I got the action to one and a quarter millimeter and uh, it's playing really great, but I think I go lower. And I go, don't get greedy. And they go, I don't know. And then a few minutes later, like, damn it. <laughs> They're like, it's buzzing all over the place. I'm like, don't get greedy. I go, if it's playing great and it's feeling great, don't go stop. And uh, so I use that ter term, not just for money. Sometimes don't get greedy means don't, you're, you're in a good place, stop, <laughs> okay? Uh, you don't need to push it. Don't push it. I guess don't push it would be better than don't be greedy. But I always thought don't be greedy was funny. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ken says, did I uh, miss the giveaway? You did not. Let's talk about that. I emailed the person and they uh, sent me an email back. So let's talk about that. The winner of the guitars was Edward Minna. Minna, I'm saying is right. A name, last name, right? Uh, and in Nebraska. So um, <laughs> I wish I could tell you the street name. That is the coolest street name, man. So anyways, uh, in Nebraska. So he won the Orangewood Acoustic. And uh, I sent him a message today. I think the the uh, it's an auto-generated uh, rotate thing. I don't know. You push a button, it randomizes. It's a randomizer. It just spit out his email. I think I've told you guys in this past, so you guys know when you enter these contests, there's a couple things to know. One, uh, I don't know any of your information. I don't see any of it. So I just get your email. So I when I email you, I don't know who you are or anything. I just email you and go, hey, you won. <laughs> okay. And then when you email me back, then I get your information because you give it to me. The other thing is also is I always now make sure that we talk about and say the person's name and everything on the show because that way the person why, uh, that won it knows that it was really me. So like I said, if you get an email from someone who say they're me, I'm also going to be talking about you and mention you on the show and you'll know for sure that way. Um, we're not, I don't ever message anybody through Instagram or, or, or WhatsApp or, uh, you know, the comment sections. I'm never going to say you won and I'm definitely never going to ask you for anything other than where to ship this guitar and that's it. So nothing else. So keep in mind on the, um, on the, uh, here it is. On the bell tone guitar, so you know, uh, Sean and I uh, box up that guitar today. It's going to Canada. The winner was in Canada, and I don't see on the email the name of the winner. Oh, okay, here it is. Uh, Bernard. Um, I have no idea how to say his last name, so Bernard, I apologize. But Bernard is from Edmonton, Canada. So you won he won the bell tone guitar, um, and that was announced on bell tone, but I'm just giving you guys an uh, uh you know, the, the, that too. And, uh, so we, uh, have not shipped your bell tone guitar yet. So, you know, um, by the way, everybody who won packs last week, we shipped that stuff out Monday. So everybody should, everybody who won something uh, on the live show last week should have it already. Uh, there's, there should be no reason why you don't have it already. Um, your, the Orangewood acoustic will go out eh, Tuesday or Wednesday ish next week. It's not going to go out first thing Monday, unfortunately. Uh, but the bell tone will go out soon. It's just, like I said, we didn't know until we got the shipping label that it was going to Canada. So, uh, it, it's not like we just drop it off our normal carrier. We have to, they have to do customs, uh, stuff. So we got to make sure we drop it off and do the custom stuff. So, um, so, <laughs> um, Fast Freddy 33 says, did you throw in some swag? Uh, Mark, uh, I threw in, we threw in, in the bell tone guitar, we put in a, um, some stickers and picks. So, so, you know, and they're the new stickers and new picks. There's new stickers, new picks. So very, I think it's exciting. I like stickers and picks. So there you go. Okay. Let's, let's jump to, uh, you know what, before I do that, let me, Amanda's been throwing me some some stuff. Uh, Amanda sent me from Matt R. Says, Phil, should I replace the pickups in my Paul Reed Smith S-E-C-E? -E? What would you suggest? Um, I mean, it's a preference, right? Should you should you change them? I, if you like them, don't change them. Don't assume because the guitar is a price point friendly guitar, comparatively speaking. I mean, it's not cheap guitar by any means. That's an expensive guitar, but I understand versus core. Don't just assume the pickups are not good. They can make pickups at any price point very good now, okay? Pickups that are $30 can be as good as $300 pickups. It's, it's, 
it's not, the ingredients are not expensive, okay? The formulas, though, are not easy to, to crack, okay? So, and that's why when PRS and companies who have made their pickups for many years, that's why they're so eager to now have these import versions of their pickups made because essentially think of it like this way. They're they're taking the ingredients and they are physically changing them because Paul Reed Smith Guitars is very upfront about the fact that they don't use the exact same ingredients for their import pickups because they because they know they can make the import pickups just as good as the as the as the US pickups. So they don't want that to be the case. Uh, I don't know if I agree with that attitude, but I understand it. Okay. Um, so those pickups are good pickups. If you don't like them, I would really have to know what is it that you don't like about them. And that's what you want to think about. What don't you like about them? Are they too aggressive? Are they breaking up your amp too fast? Are, and then maybe lowering them could help. Are they too bassy? Are they too trebly? You know, um, so you really kind of want to figure that out before I would go with any suggestions. So, but Matt, I would be remiss if I didn't say the whole know your gear thing is just learn, don't, you're not going to be miserable playing them. I always remind people, I know you're excited. I'm excited too. I want to start, I want to get some new pickups, right? I mean, I got some Gibson pickups right here that I'm putting in a guitar. <laughs> and I, I've had these now for a month and a half. I still haven't put them in a guitar, not because I don't have time, but because I'm still learning the guitar that I want to put these in. And I know where I'm going to end with this, but I still want to spend the time to, to really make sure I'm, I'm happy. Um, so, so that's what I would that's what I would suggest is uh, kind of find out exactly what you don't like about those pickups and that will help you. You won't even need my advice. From that, you'll go, you'll know what is missing. Now I know what to get. So I, I, I'm, I feel pretty confident with that. Uh, Mississippi Blues, great name. A lot of S's, man. So many S's. Mississippi says, hey, great to catch the live show from the UK. Uh, that's funny. Mississippi Blue from UK. Uh, Phil, do you have any advice for... Uh, tackling a refret for the first time. Um, I mean, I could say go slow, right? Go slow. Uh, you know, the best advice that I could give you is, is that though the thing that's going to be the biggest problem is chip out. I've said this before. Um, and you know, I have to go back, <laughs> you know, I have to go back and like, remember my first kind of, you know, my first refrets and what was the, you know, what were the biggest messes I, I had to clean up? And the biggest messes was chip out. Chip out is when you pull a fret and the teeth in the blade uh, of the of the fret have now pulled out hunks of, of wood. And first, first, you know, do what you, you know, warm up the fret, pull it carefully, try to avoid as much chip out. Uh, I've said this before, ebony is going to have the worst chip out, um, but uh, Rosewood does it. Uh, obviously, Maple does it too. The um, the next thing that you need to do is that if you do get chip out, in other words, some pieces come out, immediately get those pieces. Okay, just stop what you're doing and get those pieces. All right. I would have a. Um, I use a white uh, tray. I have a white little bowl. Um, it's because again, when you put the pieces in there, it's like, I don't like the tan, uh, trays. Like I have, t you know, wood trays like this and stuff. I don't like wood trays and stuff like this, um, for that stuff. I like white ones. Cause again, I want to be able to see those pieces because you're going to have to put those pieces back in some cases, if the chip out's too deep, because even if you, uh, play in the fretboard, it's just a mess. And so you want to glue all that stuff back in. So that's the, that's the biggie. I wouldn't worry about too much after that. Um, cause that's the mess you're going to create that you're going to have to you're going to have to address. So there you go. And don't be afraid of it. The best thing about wood is you can fix it. That's, that's the best thing about wood. So whatever you do, you can fix it. Um, with time and patience, you can fix it. Uh, tolerance performance. <laughs> hey, Phil, I recently purchased an Ormsby TX humbucker is very quiet, but when I put it in a split coil, it comes to life. No grounding issues. Height is good. Any ideas on the fix? Are we sure that it is in the positions that you think? Um, so could it be that they have messed up and made it to where, um, you know, what you think is coil split is actually the full humbucker again? Um, I know sometimes you're like, no, I know the different sound, but sometimes you don't, you know, you know what I mean? So, so they could have, they could have it flipped. That would be in the switch. So whether it's a push pull pot or a switch, they just have it switched the wrong way. So you think it's coil split. Um, the best way to tell, of course, is don't use high gain. Use uh, mid gain distortion. Think of like a Marshall Plexi kind of rock 
distortion. Uh, if you have a high gain, turn the gain down on the amp. Use a switch and just listen for that 60 cycle hum. You'll hear it buzzing, man. And so, um, and sometimes the way that we have wire up the guitars, it's a little hard to hear the 60 cycle hum. And so, again, I kind of like Occam's razor, right? All things being equal, the simplest solution is the right one. In this case, there could be a, other things going on, but I would really trust that it's just backwards and you're just not perceiving it that way. So um, I would make sure. And then if that is the case, then it's as simple as going in the switch and switching the terminals, right? Wherever it's connected, you want the opposite one uh, so that the switch is now doing the right thing. I mean, technically it doesn't really matter, you know? So, I mean, whether the switch is forward or back and it does it or up and down, but I mean, you'd probably want it the correct way they wired it. That's my first suggestion. That's what I would start with. And then if that doesn't work, let me know. Uh, 20 West Studio says, hello from Gilbert, Arizona. I purchased a player's telly from Sweetwater and I'm getting static when I move my fingers across the pickguard. Is the dry climate AZ a thing? Absolutely, man. Come on, man. It's dry, staticky. Can I fix this? Absolutely. I have a short video about it. I will link it when I do the thing. Um, <laughs> it says that basically what I use is static guard. If you look at my uh, shop videos, you can see the static guard can of it. I use static guard in a can. I spray it on a cloth. I use microfiber cloths from Costco, but you can use, um, you know, a uh, cotton or flannel. I say cotton flannel or microfiber only has to do with the fact that those won't scratch finishes. Um, so that's why I use them. You spray a little bit on there. Like I, I show you in the video, I spray a little bit on there and I tap it. So it's just damp, man. We're talking just a little bit. And then you just rub it over the pick guard. Now, in your case, that will probably resolve it. Sometimes it comes back. If it comes back, it's because it needs to be shielded and you want to shield out the cavity. However, um, sometimes it doesn't matter. So what I, what I mean by that is sometimes you can be shielded and it can be static and come back. Sometimes you can be not shielded and you remove the static and it never comes back. Every guitar is different. I've seen it all different ways. I love the internet. They love the absolute least <laughs> in the comment sections. Absolutely do this and we'll solve it. You know, I, I, um, I always think to myself, I appreciate their their uh, their desire to help, but in the repair world, uh, uh, people who talk in absolutes like that are really cruising for a bruising for problems in the future because the truth is you just don't know. You try a thing, and if that works, you try another thing, another thing. I've seen it go in a hundred different ways. But just like I can tell you right now, uh, metallic finished guitars will sometimes get more staticky than non-metallic finished guitars. That's absolutely true, so you know. Um, and it just happens. So, I mean, it's just, it's like I said, to use the static guitar uh, guard trick because it's easy and it's cheap. And then I would shield the cavity afterwards anyways and just make sure that gets done. Yeah, pa Papa C says, D don't spare on the guitar, uh, spare on the rag. I, that's why I said, watch the short. I have a full video. That's <laughs> the irony of the internet. I have a full video. It did really well years ago. We cannibalized it, chopped it up, made a short video. And the short video, obviously, people watch. It, it, and that's the best reason I do. And so, you know, almost all the short videos I do, if I do them, there's a long version video that you can connect to because some people will say, oh, I watched the short and I'm confused. And I go, well, thank goodness there's a 19 minute video too. <laughs> so uh, hopefully, you know, but some people just get the, you know, in 60 seconds, they get enough of what they need to know. Most people just, just like point me in the right direction. And I'll go. So, and some people just need more information. I get that. That's why we try to accommodate everybody. Uh, I, you know, you know, uh, says I picked up a used seventies USA made ovation acoustic with an aluminum neck. Anything I can do about the frets, man, I don't know. I've never even seen one. Um, obviously I've seen a ton of USA ovations, but I, I've never picked up or played the seventies with aluminum neck. So I just don't know. Uh, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's a rare guitar. You know, somebody in the comment section might have had one or had one back in the day and know a little bit about it, but it's not something I've seen in person worked on. And again, like I tell you guys, uh, I don't like to tell you my theories. I like to tell you what I did and what worked for me. So, uh, or didn't work for me. Cause I feel like, uh, that way, if it goes wrong for you, at least it was a heartfelt, like, Hey, I tried it. This is what I did, <laughs> but I don't want to, I don't want to just give guesses if I can help help it unless I, you know, no, I just don't want to. How about that? Uh, okay. Let's, let's jump around. Okay. So Parker, thank you. Uh, he said, Parker says, Hey, Phil, should I get a seven inch or 17 inch music nomad fret leveler for my first one? I would go with seven inch. I'll tell you why in a second. Any updates on the, on the production Northern lights pickups? Yes. Uh, yes to both. So, uh, first seven inch is what I would get, uh, for a fret lever leveler, uh, over 17 inch is because 
the longer beam is going to be when you're just doing all the frets okay so it's it's not impossible but it's very impractical to do a spot or an area of leveling on the neck um, the seven inch you can do the whole neck with seven inches seven inch beam you could do it so that's the difference seven inch will do the spot leveling and the small areas and it will do the whole neck the 17 will only do the whole neck um, the way i would look at this is and this is the important part because this kind of sometimes the, con the confusion is um when you're looking at tools especially on stu mac or music nomad you're like well why do they make two versions what, what is the purpose here and i've had this conversation and i like to uh, share it with you guys because i've had it so much time so many times privately with companies um, some tools are more for repair and some are for building. So that's why I've, I, I, I've say this all the time. Um, a seven inch beam is something I would use almost every day in my shop in some way, fixing somebody, something. But if I was building guitars all day, I would bet you, I would just have the longer, uh, sanding beams because I'm just going to be doing all the frets. I just fretted it. So let's just do all the frets. Right. Um, and, and in work like repair, part of your process is efficiency of speed of fixing things because so, that keeps the cost down for the customer but also keeps um, your overhead down how long you're spending with something but uh, so sometimes you just want to quickly fix a thing right so i would do seven inch uh, updates on the northern lights pickups in a production yes the answer is um I have not had a chance to talk to my wife about how we're going to make a more efficient packaging for the production pickups. So um, I think I feel pretty confident by next week, I'll have an answer for you guys. I just need to talk to her about how we're going to get packaging uh, more efficient because, and then we can sell them. And, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll, um, so basically, if you guys don't know what we're talking about, Parker uh, obviously mentions uh, rumors when I mentioned in the past. We're going to have a set of Northern Lights, the Northern, the pickups that I that I like that I make. We're going to have um, it's a production run, and the price is going to be brought down. The specs are the same as I've told you guys. I've went went through a ton of prototypes, a ton of ways to do this, and so the price will go dramatically from three nineteen a set down to like one seventy nine a set. And essentially, it's going to be the same same pickups. Um, when I say essentially, I mean spec-wise. They'll spec the same. They'll look the same. They'll feel the same. They're all, both made in the USA. Just, like I said, one's more of a production. It's going to be more of a mass-produced type type pickup. And one's going to be less of a, like, I just did it by my, you know, you know, just me and the winder all by myself with no, no uh, CNC winder or, or no uh, auto winding, no, no, nothing like that. So production ones what, will drop the price almost in half, which is important, right? Um, and then we'll, we'll, I'll be announcing that soon. So keep in mind. If you want to be part of that announcement, uh, patrons and members will get announced first. That's just how it works. But don't worry about that. Um, you can also go to blackstockpickups.com and be, get on the emailing list and you'll get notified when that get, gets kicked out too. Uh, Hector says, hey, uh, can pick guard scratches be polished or buffed out? Absolutely, uh, yes. I mean, it's a pick guard, and that's what you're supposed to do to scratch it. But I understand uh, you want to uh, – first, it depends on the type of pick guard. Okay, what I mean by that is not the color. <laughs> Black pick guards are harder to buff than white pick guards. But, no, it's uh, – sometimes the pick guard material can be slightly different than others. Um, those, those outliers would be like uh, maybe – like I'm talking about like aluminum pick guards versus, you know, plastic. Most of the plastic pick guards are the same. Uh, to do that, there's a couple things. First, if you have minor scratches and no big deal, you can just get some uh, swirl remover or scratch remover compound and a uh, cloth and just hand buff and most of that stuff will come out. Um, it's uh, Think of it like you're, you're sanding and buffing, but you're doing it to a, a small... Um, a, a, a small amount, right? Okay, small amount. Um, the other thing you can do if that if that doesn't work, um, you can use a buffing wheel if you have one. That's how I would do it. Is I have a big buffing wheel and I would just buff it, uh, and that works. <laughs> and then, uh, or you can even so uh, some people are going to tell you to sand it. The problem is, is this is where the problem is. Sanding can become a problem if you can't buff it correctly. Um, so I would say when we say sand it. I mean, I would be talking about, again, like steel wool, like triple lot steel wool, quadruple lot steel wool. Um, we're, we're not talking about like 300 grit or 400 grit even. That's too, that's too aggressive even then. Um, 
but I would I would start with just swirl or scratch remover compounds and either a a, a, a buffing wheel on a drill or a, a cloth and just try to buff it out that way. Um, that will help. Um, somebody's saying turtle wax buffing compound. Same same thing. Great. Uh, G boy 1973. Great great suggestion. Same same concept. Uh, when I say buffing swirl remover and stuff, that's essentially turtle wax. You know anything carnauba wax based things. Anything. Think of it this way. You're imagine you're trying to, in fact, uh, uh, G boy, 1973 really kind of, cause that suggestion really kind of made the, and this makes more sense to say, think of it. Like you're just trying to take out some light swirl marks out of your, uh, your, uh, car. In fact, my wife had some light squ- swirl marks, uh, scratches in her car. And I just took exactly that my buffing compound and I buffed them out. And so yeah, that's what you're going to do. You're just going to buff the pick card. The main thing you're trying to worry about with the pick card though, that's different than a car is, is heat. You can warp or melt the pick card. So you do not want to just kind of like, <laughs> you know, you don't want to go. Yeah, that's why I said, maybe do it by hand or something. You want to keep it, keep the friction low, keep the heat to non-existent. Cause not only can you warp the pick guard, um, but you can damage it with just the heat more so than the scratches. Uh, Jeff says, if you were getting your first PRS and the choice was either the SE DGT, the Dave Grissom model, or the Swamp S Special, what would you choose and why? This is great because I've reviewed and deep dive both those guitars. Um, I like them both for different reasons. Uh, I don't know why, you know, when I get these questions, I've been asked this question, I, these questions in the past with different SEs and different guitars, and I always seem to give you an answer. And then I feel like if you asked me three weeks from now, I'd give you a different answer. So I'll, it's not because I'm, it's because sometimes it's what mood I'm in when you ask. Right now, I think I'm more of in the DGT mood. I really like the Swamp Ash Special. In fact, um, I have a, a, a PRS Studio and um, it's basically just like the Swamp Ash Special. There's a lot of sound combinations of Swamp Ash. I like the Maple Neck, but maybe Dave Grissom more. I don't know. They're both so good. These are these questions that I love because, man, what a great problem to have for you. <laughs> Should I get this really good guitar or this other really good guitar? <laughs> like, eh, get the good guitar. Uh, but I'm going to say for now, DGT, um, but not because it's better, just because in my mind right now, maybe that's where the mood I'm in playing that kind of guitar right now, more so than the Ash, but the Ash is great. Uh, Declan, what's up, Declan? He says, hey, Phil, do you think Sire will be able to maintain their high quality bar given their significantly expanded uh, the product line? Um well, you know, that's the problem, right? The more you, the more skews you add, the more problems you're adding. Um, you know, um, this is, uh, this is why companies like Fender and other companies want to keep the skews, you know, and they're not, I'm not, when I say Fender out loud, I kind of feel bad. They're not specifically doing anything different than anybody else. Even Paul Reed Smith has cut skews dramatically over the years. I mean, you know, for those of us that remember PRS back in the day, you know, just a custom 24 could have an insane amount of options. You could get the, you get the, the blade switch, you could get the toggle switch, you could get the wide thin neck, you could get the wide fat neck, you could get tremolo or hardtail. I mean, it was just crazy. That was just one product would be like 10 skews of one product. And they, they learned that lesson that just too many things. Um, so... I would imagine Sire, I don't know, I don't know what their capacity is. I don't know what they're, you know, what they can do uh, for guitar wise. But I mean, yes, it's, it's not going to be easier for them to do that. My guess though, is that um, they're smart because they're expanding the line and they're going to see what works. And over time, they'll just start decreasing the the units that don't work. That's a smart move. But I don't think, uh, I don't know. I don't know of any information that would concern me like, oh, stay away until they get that figured out. Um, I don't I don't see that to be the case. Um, I know we talked about uh, COVID and we definitely talked about production and uh, especially in Fender where the quality has dramatically gone down and um, because of the high production demands. Um, But what we don't know in Sire's case is that companies that are import-esque companies, they're a little different because when Fender goes, hey, we're going to increase production by 10% next month, if they don't increase staffing, if they don't increase capacity, well, they, you know what I mean, capacity, they don't increase, the, you know, more machines, more, you know, bigger footprint, they're working the, what they have to the, to the limit. But in, when they do import guitars, you don't know if, like, is Sire just... Ex- like we're tapping into another factory. I mean, this happens a lot. 
Um, what I would be curious about, okay, so you know, is, uh, and, and so you know, it's so ingrained in me and my wife from being in this industry. I'm going to tell you a funny, funny thing, Declan, because uh, you won't relate, maybe, <laughs> but you'll understand. Um, when companies expand production lines, Schechter's done this in the past, um, one thing that happens is your your immediate assumption is, is that everything that's coming out will be the same. In other words, Schechter's adds, they double the lineup next year in this theory. And you go, wow, that's a lot more guitars coming out of the World Factory in Korea. And then you start noticing that half the guitars are coming from Indonesia and other factories. So you understand. So Sire could be making the guitars in one place, but they could also also have moved to a bigger facility with more production ability and more people. And that could be why they're expanding. Or they could just be like, for these models, we're going to another factory. Manufacturers are doing this all the time. Why I said it's funny is my wife and I, if you haven't been to Target, it's pretty cool. <laughs> no, anyways, if you've been to Target, uh, we were in Target and they brought back Tupperware. I, I, I don't know if Tupperware was gone, but if you grew up like me, my mom sold Tupperware when I was a kid. And um, it was, I don't know much about it other than it was probably expensive because my mom used to freak out about her Tupperware. Um, and so we were walking in Target yesterday and they had Tupperware at the end aisle and we said Tupperware and they're making it. It's actually, it's like vintage Tupperware. I can't make this crap up. And uh, you guys can Google it on target.com if you want. <laughs> Anyways, they make vintage Tupperware and it looks exactly like it did, right? Like when I remember it as a little kid, it's exactly like the same. It looks the same. And... Um, we were laughing about it, you know, having that old, oh, Tupperware when we were kids. And we flipped the packaging over and it says made in USA since 1946 and it's all made in USA. And so we were like, oh, let's get some Tupperware, right? And, but our first instinct was since it was different containers, different types of containers, for Tupperware, we actually looked at each one because we're like, just because one says made in USA, maybe the smaller ones are made in China and the other ones are made in Vietnam or whatever. And it's not the same, but it was all made in USA. So the reason I tell you that is that that's because we were ingrained for the reason I just told you. Some companies like Petals, some com Petals are made in USA. Um, this happens with all kinds of brands that you, you're like, oh, these, this company makes all their Petals in USA. And I'm like, no, these four models are made actually in China. Um, you know, uh, MXRs like that. Some MXRs are made in USA and some MXRs are made overseas. It depends on the skew and what it is. So this goes back, Declan, to your question, which is, I don't know what Sire and their situation, but I, maybe they're not all going to be made in Indonesia. Maybe some are now made in China or other factories as well. So we'll, we'll need to pay attention to that, which is why I think why we, do, you know, I think now that reviewers are more tenured, uh, you're noticing it more. We're like, this is where the country of manufacturing is. This is where the stuff is. And some people go, does it matter? And I go, well, it's not that it matters. It's almost like thinking like we're archiving this information. It's going to be forever. So it's going to be nice in 10 years when you're buying something. If you go look at a, a version of the product you bought 10 years ago, what did they change? Specification wise, shape wise, size wise, color wise, manufacturing, what changed? It, it, I think it'll be interesting to know, especially if you're a, a geek like me. So there you go. And if you're not a geek like me, I don't know why you're hanging out right now because <laughs> somebody's making you. You're standing next to somebody who is the geek. Uh, Steve Cassidy Guitar says, uh, hello, Phil. Uh, strap back plates on or off? Well, that's easy. Let's show you. Off. <laughs> I'm going to say off. <laughs> I got another one. Do I have another strat over here? I don't. That's oh well. No, I got a. It's not a strat. Uh, this beautiful Charvel off. I don't know if you guys ever seen this. Look at this. Woo! Isn't that beautiful? It's got my logos in it. I love this Charvel. So okay. So, sorry, I walked away from the mic. Uh, for those that are watching the progress letter, listening to it, I went and just showed a bunch of my guitars don't have the backplate. Uh, so backplates are uh, backplate off. When I, uh, when I released the Delos <laughs> at uh, Kiesel's factory, <laughs> this is funny. I think it's funny. Um, they were about, you know, they have an on-air sign, very professional. <laughs> right? and so Brandon's about to hit the on-air sign. We're about to go live. And Jeff is sitting down, and as he sits down, his eyes catch the back of my guitar, and he says, wait, to Brandon, wait. And he grabs my neck on the guitar, and he goes, you don't have your backplate. We need to grab one and put it on. And I go, oh, I don't, I don't have the backplate on the guitar ever. And he goes, 
oh, well, we need to update your model for backplate delete. And I go, yeah, I didn't, I didn't ask for backplate delete. And he goes, I don't understand. I go, I don't want to, I don't want to pay to have the, <laughs> I don't want to pay just to have the, you know, you have to pay more, not because the screws are missing. You know, they don't put the screws. It's because they got to make the inside of the cavity look really pretty because there's nothing covering up, right? So there, it's an added time, added cost thing, right? And for those of you that disagree with that, like, oh, that's stupid. Uh, well, then you do the work, <laughs> right? If, you know, and the employee wants more money, if it takes them more time, they want more money. So he's got to pay more money. You get the math. Um, but my point is, he was like, well, we should do a delete. And I go, nah, they can just leave it on or take it off. <laughs> I go, we don't have to pay to have it not on there. Um, so to answer your question, uh, yeah, I leave them all off. Um, you know, it's a, it's a habit. It has nothing to do with other than that's what years and years of working on guitars uh, makes you do. It just makes you lazy to work on your guitars. You take the back plate off one day. I'd like to tell you I did for any other reason than that. I took the back plate off one day off all those guitars to do something, and I did that. I'm not putting it back on. Because, <laughs> you know, it's the customer's guitar. you got to put it back on. <laughs> they, you know, right? But for me, I'm like, I don't have to do it. Just leave it out. Who cares? So, okay. Um, did we? Yeah, we answered. Oh, that was a great question, Steve. Thank you. Alex says, hey, my first wraparound tailpiece, a Gibson Les Paul special. Opinions on the known bridge tilt and compensated replacements like the music city bridge stud finder anything else i should know about specials i i this is one of those things thank you for the question this is really uh alex more of a reminder that you need to check that out so you guys know there's some been some really cool interesting i don't want to say innovations but maybe innovations in the tail pieces on gibsons and changing the angle so you don't have to wrap over the top round and stuff and i've seen that and just like i did the uh, safe file by um Music Nomad, because I saw that it was sent to me and suggested. It was suggested on the Patreon WhatsApp groups. And, uh, you know, I, I ended up going with the file before that. But I'm going to get that bridge and, and and test it and do some videos. So at least give you some feedback on it. Because, again, I know that's one of the, the things that's nice is, you know, I can get this stuff, make a video, and, you know, and that way you guys can at least see. Because I get it. It's tough, man. It's tough to buy all this stuff. It's like I said, it's tough when you're online, look at all this stuff, and you're like, I don't know, is it any good? Is it hype? What is it? So we'll figure it out. Uh, Grubby Mike Guitar says, for the tone jar and why not, uh, do you think Court can ever achieve legitimate status as a higher-end manufacturer's cheers? Yes. Uh, the reason I say that is because... Uh, now, can they do it next month? <laughs> can they do it next year? N no. But can they do it over a long period of time? Absolutely. The reason I know that is because it's been done. There are all kinds of high-end stuff. There's all kinds of crap we buy now that's expensive. I mean, Fender. Fender was cheap. It was a cheap brand. That's what it was. It started out as like mass producing stuff. It was the McDonald's of musical gear. It was like, how do I make this cheap so everybody can afford it? That was his like whole purpose for making the guitars. So, and now it's high-end. Uh, you know, Harley Davidson bikes were originally, you know, just, you know, basically little, little cheap motorcycles. And now, you know, they cost more than a car. So, so brands do kind of, if they do focus on that. Um, the, the better question, although that was a great question, so I don't want to say a better question. The, the add on to your question is how does court do that? Now, here's what's interesting and, uh, about court, this new guitar, if you didn't see my deep dive, um, watch it, you'll see what I got to say, which is that it, the quality is there. Me personally, though, if court had asked me, which, you know, they're not going to ask me. <laughs> But if they reach out besides saying, hey, could you do a video and, and you, know, you know check it out and see what you think, that'd be great. But if they would have sent me prototypes of this and said, you know, eight months ago and said, hey, we're, we're going to expand the lineup, you know, we're going to kind of do things. What do you suggest? I would have suggested other things. Um, and the reason is, is because I think first thing to do if you want to become a legitimate manufacturer is you have to differentiate yourself from the group. Okay. Um, you know, you just have to, okay. The, 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 why court has value is because court is making millions of guitars for other manufacturers. So, you know, they can make a good guitar, right? I love when people are like, I had a court, it was crap. Yeah. They didn't make those. <laughs> and they, I had a court, it was great. And they make those. And I bought a brand that was made by court and it was crap. And they make those. And they had a court for a guitar built by court. And it was great. And they make those. I mean, Court makes a guitar that's for a brand that's really inexpensive and probably okay and not that great. And then they make a Strandberg for $2,500 that can play great. I mean, they can do, you know, they have capacity for everything. And so, but 
the fact that they make a good guitar doesn't really differentiate them from anybody um, else. They would need to have a unique look, I think. Um, you know, um, one thing I would caution is, although I think this is a great looking guitar, I actually prefer the look, um, and it's a good idea. Um, it's got a Harley Bitten vibe to it, like, and I say this with respect. To me, that is a great guitar if you don't want to spend a lot of crazy money uh, for a high-end, you know, kind of Kiesel, $3,000 Kiesel or $2,500 Kiesel, and you want to get, you know, sub $1,500 and get the same specs, that's a great idea. Great pickups. I mean, you know, every that's great. But to me, that's all you're getting is you're getting a very good guitar that doesn't have a Kiesel brand or a high-end brand, Ibanez brand on it. And that's great because uh, for the ones out there that are not brand snobs, good for you for just focusing on the quality. That's the, probably the best lesson you can learn is focus on the quality and the, the ingredients, quality construction, you know, execution, and not just the brand logo. But like we talked about, there is value in building a good brand because you're, you're, be you're not only building something that people want, you're building the resale value. And that lets people take chances. Resale value is important. It is super important and it's going to become psychotically super important because as much as there is comments in every video everywhere of, I don't care about the resale value. I don't know what you guys are so focused on, which is I'm always like, good for you guys for buying once and loving it. But the rest of us buy it to discover it. You know, we're trying to find out if we like it. What do we like? We, and it's a calculated decision, you know, um, it's why you date people before you get married, <laughs> you know, right? I mean, most people, I don't know, most people don't go, oh, I met this girl. She was the first girl I ever met. And I'm like, you're a girl. Let's get married. I mean, usually you go, oh, I dated a couple girls. This one's crazy. And these ones are nice. And then from that, you start figuring out like, here's what I care about. And you refine your taste and you refine what you're looking for. And you kind of figure out what you're going to do. And, um, and my favorite thing is when people go out, I've always said this, they go, um, I will never buy a guitar on the internet. That's just stupid. And I'm like, people find their significant other on the internet now. I mean, I had a friend go, oh, people buy cars on the internet. I go, screw cars. People get their wives and husbands off the internet. If you can find a wife or a husband off the internet, you can buy a guitar. It's not that, it's not that extreme. Okay. And you do it almost the same way. It's like if reverb had swipe left, swipe right on the, on the things, that would actually, that'd be great. <laughs> Like for us married folks that don't know the single experience of that stuff, that's what I would assume it would be. I'd be like, strat, keep that, strat, don't want that, <laughs> right? 80s PV, <peavy>, maybe, <laughs> right? Um, so, so anyways, my point is resale value is important because when you invest in uh, an idea, like I think I'm going to like this and I think it might be right and I'm going to pay for it, and then you get it and you find out it's not, it's really not exciting to lose an ins half your money, the majority of your money on a bad decision. It's a lot less painful to go, oh, I spent, you know, $500. I'm getting 412 of that back and I'll just move on my way, you know, right? And then you kind of do the math. I don't know, maybe you're like me, maybe you're not. I do math all the time like, well, if I went to Top Golf for the night, that's what I lost in this. I do that a lot. I like to steak dinner a lot. I'll go, yeah, I sold that guitar and basically I lost going out to steak dinner once, you know, so I just won't go to steak dinner this week. And that kind of, you know, that, that rationalizes my, my, my thing. So, um, <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense, but my point is, is that court, uh, needs to build its, uh, value. I don't know if I didn't say it in the video, um, because it was in their ad copy and I didn't really want to talk about it, but they also redesigned their logo. I didn't know if people, people would care. And so I didn't really kind of focus on that in the video. I was more focused on the quality because I think that's the selling point of a court guitar is getting quality. But value, uh, brand value building is important because people are less likely to take a chance if they think they're going to get, you know, if you're going to take a bath on it, especially when you don't have to, you know. Um, when in doubt, I hate saying this, when in doubt, I buy Gibsons. I've said this for years. I buy Gibsons all the time. I've never lost money on a Gibson. When I say never, I mean, if I take all the Gibsons I've ever bought in my life and add up what I spent and what I got back, net zero, I, I, I would love, I can't even say I'm net zero. I'm net positive. If I lost some money on a Gibson, I mean, think about this. I did a video in 2017 where I walked into Sam Ash and I go, what guitar would I buy $500? And I found a Gibson uh, satin finished gold top with P90s for $400 and I bought that. Two years later, they were 850 bucks. So I sold it. 
Then a couple, two, three years later, people are like, you still have that? I'm like, no, I doubled my money and I bought another Gibson. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like, I liked it, but I bought it on a whim for a make a video because I wanted to, you know, it was a fun video to do and I enjoyed it, but it wasn't like it was a dream guitar for me. It was like, a, hey, this is a cool guitar. This is a good price on this. I think I'm going to try it. Let's do it. And then when it doubled, I go, eh, let's find something I'm truly more interested in. And I ended up getting a, a nicer Gibson Les Paul. Um, so... So, like I said, Gibsons have some of the best resell in the market. So do Fenders. Fenders definitely up there with Gibson. I think Gibson's a little higher, but Fender and Gibson. And then, you know, there's PRS and then there's Squire and Epiphone, all those guys too. But like I said, so resale value is important. It's going to be important for the future. If, if companies don't realize that, I think they're going to find how scary it is when people don't want to take a chance on their product when they can't touch them anymore. You know, when we go to a 75% direct-to-consumer business model, which is the future. It's the future. I, I, and I'd like to point out, I'm not saying I want this future. I'm not saying I'm behind this future. I'm saying if you don't think that, if you don't understand that's not only coming, it's here. It's just who's re realizing it's here. You can't have every YouTube channel pretty much going, NAM's over. No one wants to go to NAM. NAM is a dealer show. They're saying the dealer show is over, <laughs> right? Um, sure, there's going to be Sweetwater, but think of how many brands are sold at Sweetwater that are also sold direct to consumer. So direct to consumer market, well, Sweetwater is direct to consumer market. You don't physically go and touch the guitars, it's direct to consumer. I understand I'm not really saying that correctly because it's not direct manufacturing consumer, but I guess I want to say it's, Sweetwater is, as I always say, it's buy before you try, right? You, you have to do it calculated. So there you go. Mm. BC Rich 501 says, I don't like them, but Rick's hold their value too. I agree. I mean, a lot of guitars hold value. We talked about this. Artist guitars, I think, some hold some of the best values on any guitar in the industry, no matter what the brand. It's almost like an artist guitar is a, is a sure thing, right? Because I've said it before. It's the artist doesn't go anywhere. When they stop making the model, they're still going to be fans 10 years from now. Maybe they're not as popular as they once were. Maybe they're not the huge arena seller they were once were, but there's still going to be people who like them and they haven't made the guitars in 10 years. The guitars will still have value. That's why most artist guitars, I, I'd say most, I don't, I know very few artist guitars that over in a series haven't gained value at some point. So. Uh, uh, let's see. Just looking at some of the stuff we we're talking about. Uh, Nefar, Nefar, Nefar 10 says, speaking of direct consumer, has Volo Guitars reached out to you to, uh, for a video? Um, no, they're never going to do that. <laughs> Let's just say that. That's never going to happen. Uh, the, the, I wouldn't say they're fans of the show. <laughs> Look. Can't win them all. I can't win. I can't. Look, I'm not that charming, guys. I can't win over all these companies. Okay, a lot of them hate me. <laughs> it just happens. I gave them a video. I paid for one of their guitars and I did a video. Uh, like I said, because you guys asked for it, so I did it. But uh, so, to, in other words, what I'm trying to say is, if Vola was on here again, it would be because I bought one again. I'm not going to buy one again. I bought one. I did a video for you guys. I sold it. Lost money on that one. Um, I mean, think of this. I bought a guitar from them for, for dealer cost, and I still couldn't get what I paid for it. So that was uh, that is fine. It's fine, actually. Um, and, you know, I told this story, I think, to the patrons. Maybe one day I'll tell it to you guys, too. The Vol Vola is why I'm with Kiesel. That's the irony of this. That is the crazy... I'm not going to tell it today. I don't care what you guys say. But if you hit me enough times on it in the future, I'll talk about it. The reason I have a relationship with Kiesel Guitars is 101% because of Vola Guitars. They created the situation. It's, I needed to do some, I needed to do a video for you guys for Vola. And just, it's just weird to see how two companies can dramatically react differently to the same video because they were both in the same video. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm getting off track. Uh, Chris says, hey, I bought an LTD H1001 Deluxe. Uh, has direct mount as Seymour Duncan sentient pickups in the bridge. Action too high, lowered, but strings hit and uh, pickup. Okay. Tried to lower the pickup and it won't go down. Screws 
and the pickup uh, when I try lower. Okay, so what you have to do, Chris, is this is what you want to do. So first, get yourself a nice uh, uh, either a, a rag or uh, you know again 100% cotton or flannel or a cotton shirt. You need something. So cloth, just trust me on this, okay? It's very important, okay? I want you to think about it. Uh, think of it like when you're working on your car, if you've ever worked on a car, and you have a mat that you throw over the fender, right? Um, you need to have a cloth. What I want you to do is uh, take off the strings. Don't loosen the strings. They need to come off, okay? Take off the strings in the guitar. Um, then I want you to put the cloth probably on the front part of the guitar, okay? But on the front side, but it doesn't matter what side because you're going to take the pickups out and pull them upside down and lay them on the cloth. The reason you're going to do this is not only can the pickups scratch the guitar, the screws sticking out of the bottom of the pickups can scratch the guitar dramatically. And even if you think you're going to be careful, don't take the chance. Rest them on something. Don't let them have any way of touching the finish on the guitar. What you'll do is you'll back out both screws to both pickups. You'll take out both pickups. You'll flip them upside down. You'll lay them on the, on the body of the guitar uh, that has a cloth or something to protect it. And then what I want you to do is investigate what is underneath those pickups. What probably is underneath those pickups is a piece of foam about one inch thick. It could be an inch and a half thick, okay? Now there is a small chance, not likely, that there is a piece of foam with two holes cut through it with two springs in there. That is not likely what's underneath there. What is likely underneath there though is a piece of, of hard, dense rubber foam. What I want you to do is approximate, okay? Just guesstimate, whatever you want to call it, do your best guess. I want you to think about how far you can't get down, right? So you're like, oh man, if it can only go, you know, uh, an eighth of an inch, okay? I want you to take a pair of scissors and I want you to cut the foam, right? So the foam that goes underneath, I want you to thin it down about an eighth of an inch. That's about enough. You might have to do this twice. It's not the end of the world. Um, don't cut the foam in half. <laughs> you'll be sorry because then you'll be like, damn, it's too much. Um, and even don't be feel bad if you end up having to cut it three or four times and then you go, Phil lied. It's almost about half. I mean, I'm giving you the best guess because again, uh, every situation is going to be different. You're going to cut down that foam. Then put the foam back in. Sometimes the foam is stuck in there with, du uh, with double stick on it. And when you cut the bottom off, it's not on there. If you have some du double stick tape, great. If not, just hold it in there uh, the best you can and put the pickups back in. The reason, now, I, what I want you to do, do though is pay attention because you don't want those screws to go so deep now that they stick out the back of the guitar. You can damage the guitar that way too. Don't don't worry. Wh whatever I'm saying, if it sounds hard, it's not, okay? You just you just need to get a little lower and that foam is just compressed to the point where it's, it's, a, it's a very dense, hard rubber foam. So it just doesn't want to go down anymore. So that's all you need to do. And... Uh, that's it. Okay. Um, and don't try and find things in, that people tell you, cause they're going to tell you, people are going to comments later are going to be like, Oh, just get yourself some, some, don't get yourself anything. Don't stick anything else in there. Just use the dense foam. They have it. That foam works great for a reason. It just needs to be a little thinner cause the pickups were, you know, you're there. The, the, it comes, like I said, it comes standard, like inch, inch and a half. And they just stick it in there and it, cause it works in 90% of the time. So it just needs to be thinner. So there you go. Um, Uh, no, Vela Vangela, you, no, he's direct mounted. So Vela Vangela says he tightened the screws. Yep. He's tightening down and that raised the pickup. It would, if his pickups were floating, his pickups are direct mounted. So you're thinking like he's got a screw and the screw is in the, 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 uh, wings of the, the pickup and it's like raising and lowering like an elevator. It's not, he's got two screws going through the pickup into the body, the tighter he screws the screws, the more the pickup goes into the body. So you would be right if it was floating. He said, and I'm going to double check now because you know you got me like even doubting myself, which is fine. Uh, he said, has direct mount Seymour Duncan sentient pickups. He is direct mounted. So there you go. The um, Chris, just be careful about the length of those screws because again, you don't want them sticking through the back. So kind of also pay attention to that. If you think the screw, like, man, it doesn't look like there's a lot farther it can go, I would actually take something and cut the screw a little shorter or find another screw like it and size-wise and use a different shorter screw. You should be okay. Uh, I've done this so many times, what you're about to do. It shouldn't be that hard if you just need a little bit more to go down, okay? Just a little bit. So there you go. I hope that all makes sense. Uh, Sunbase with S E N N, like the brand of base amps, says for the swear jar. Is that what we have a swear jar now? I, you know, I like to keep my uh, my my curse words on the show to when they they there need to be there. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, I can get bad. You know, I can use a curse word like a comma. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> when I'm talking and in, 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 when I'm not in public. Um, okay, so <laughs> uh, Lippy says, Phil, please release the rant as an independent vid. Yeah, you know, the, the funny thing is those the rants and stuff when you go, like I said, negative travels twice as fast as and twice as far as positive on the internet. And, you know, it's important. I, I think it's important to have these conversations and I like to get it off my chest. But sometimes... Uh, I said this before, you got to watch what, what happens. I never want to become successful for the negative thing. Um, cause then I'm going to, you're, that's what you have to make. You know, you don't want to, you don't, I don't want to make negative stuff. I want to keep things positive, but I want to keep things honest and positive. And the truth is if you're always positive, you're not being honest. You know, that's just, it's not, the, it's, it's, it's impossible. So, but I want to be honest, so I, I, I say negative things, I say positive things, but I do try to minimize and downplay the, the negative things because, again, I want us to have fun. At the end of the day, I want you guys to like, hey, man, it was great talking about guitars. Now I'm going to go get pissed off about the world. <laughs> right? It's the other podcast that should be making you nuts, right? All the Every other podcast, the political podcast, the, uh, all that stuff. That's the stuff that's supposed to be making us, spin us out crazy. This is where we're supposed to get centered back to the things we love and realize like, oh, man, not everything's crazy. The guitars are still fun. But I understand what you're saying, Lipe. Thank you for that. Mike says, hey, Phil, how do you know if an acoustic guitar needs a next set? And how do you tell if it needs, if an acoustic needs to be refretted? Um, well, refret's easy because the the frets are low, super low. Um, it doesn't mean because they're super low, they need to be refretted. Um, I've refretted guitars just because the players, like, they're just lower than the player wants and they feel like they're rubbing their finger against the, the fretboard and they don't like it. But in most cases, the frets are just worn down too low. Obviously, sometimes they have divots in them, and even though you've, you've leveled and crowned them and stuff, they're just... You know, there's still divots. It's just too deep. Or like, again, you've leveled them too low and then you replaced. Um, a neck set, I, I've done about a half a dozen of them, uh, acoustic net set, neck sets. As I've said before, you know, you see, I was not a, a not a, a, a gu acoustic guitar luthier. And so a lot of high-end acoustic guitar players will take, seek out and search for a luthier, acoustic luthier to do their acoustic work, which makes sense, right? Um, and what I would work on mostly was thousand dollar and below acoustics. And even though a thousand dollars is a lot of money, especially pre-inflation terms, pre-2019 terms, a lot of players are not going to pay to have, you know, their $899, you know, acoustic neck reset. So, um, to know when it needs a reset, I'd have to look at the situation and stuff. I mean, it's not as common. Refrets are very common for me in my arena. But like you see uh, you see uh, luthiers, like driftwood guitars and stuff that, that really kind of focus on acoustic guitars, they're gonna do so many of those. Um, like I told you guys this story once, I said Matt from Texas Toast and I were talking one day and we were talking about tool sets and ideas. And I know I just told the story, so it's boring. So I'll just tell you the highlight again. He, I said, hey, we were talking about a problem, a particular problem with a particular guitar. And I said, hey, this is what I would do to fix it. And he goes, nah, I'd just build a new one, <laughs> right? And the reason I tell that story is because it's a perfect analogy of he's got a shop where he builds guitars. To him, three hours, he's got a new, new, new neck, new guitar. He's done. He's going to do that. In my shop, um, three hour, it was three hours to fix it. So I would just fix it. Does it make sense? My mindset was fix it, but also his mindset was nobody owned this guitar, so he can just build a new one. My mindset was this was somebody's personal guitar. They don't, no one's coming back for a repair job and go, did you fix my guitar? And I go, no, but I got you a new one, <laughs> right? So, uh, so that's just said different, different, uh, different workloads and stuff. That's why, like I said, I don't do, I didn't do a lot of refinish work either because of the type of repairs I would do. Uh, Harmonicaster says opinion on Jack White's Donner Three FX ninety nine pedal. I saw that. I saw it was one of the highlights of the Nam show. Selling direct and made in China, they're probably making more than JHS does on USA made ninety nine dollar pedals. That's not really well. It's not necessarily not true, and isn't it? It could be necessarily true. Um, kind of understand like you know JHS pedals at ninety nine dollars. I mean they are assembled or made in USA. I don't really know. I, I've I, I've not seen. Uh, you know, the, like, like guitar manufacturers, right? Guitar manufacturers, um, you know, I've been to the factories and I know what's being built there and what's not being built there. You know, as I told you guys, very few to know manufacturers, guitar manufacturers, especially in the U.S., have a machine shop. So they're not building their bridges for the most part. And they're not building, um, 
their tuning keys and stuff. They're just ordering that stuff because they don't have a machine shop to do that stuff. It's just the things have changed. Um, same thing with pedal manufacturers. What I see a lot with pedal manufacturers, and and this would go for JHS. And again, I'm not an authority of pedals, guys. I'm just telling you what I saw. Like, so I, th- I got to switch gears on this, right? There's a difference between like, hey, man, I spent my whole life learning everything I can to fix guitars or learn about guitars. And then there's like, I love pedals too. So that's this, I love pedals too, is where the information comes from. And I love pedals too mode. What I would say is what I've seen with a lot of pedal manufacturers is, is that um, there's a lot of the boards and a lot of stuff are made in China. And then they get the boxes made here in the US. A lot of them are just going through all pedals and the companies like that to make the boxes, have them powder coated and sometimes uh, labeled. And then sometimes they're labeling and, and laser etching and stuff, the, the boxes themselves, and then they assemble everything here. So yes, that assembly process is expensive. It adds to the expense of the pedal. And if, obviously if they had all that stuff done in China, it would cut down on their costs. But it's also in volume. You have to hit certain volumes and stuff. So my point is, yes, Donner would be making more money, but I don't know. I don't know. I, what I want to really say is I don't know how much. I don't know if it's a windfall. Does that, I mean, it's silly, but um, it could equate to the Donner pedal doing it that way. Also, it's three effects in one, and there's more factors. And again, I'm not a pedal guy, um, but I'm going to say that even if it was apples to apples, which it doesn't sound, in this scenario, it's not because the JHS pedals you're talking about are a one pedal thing, and his is a three pedal one. Um, let's say that Donner can make Three dollars more to four dollars more per pedal. That's really co- what could be what it be. We're talking about here. It's a few dollars, but a thousand pedals. I mean, that's three thousand dollars. Ten thousand pedals. That's thirty thousand dollars. You know, see what I'm saying? It can add up those dollars quick. So, but interesting. Uh, but I like the comment. I like the question. So, um, and part of that too is, uh, you know, this is uh, we can't be naive, <laughs> us as consumers. During the pandemic, you know, China locks down and all of a sudden 90% of the stuff we can't get made. You're like, what? <laughs> like I said, it was either they didn't, the parts were coming from China or the or the materials were coming. So we know that when we say made in USA, we understand what we're saying is not 100% made in USA, right? It's just finished here, or the, most of it's done here. Um, that's usually what we're talking about with pedals and stuff, at least in my experience. But uh, Josh Scott would know better than me by far. By, by a million yards, but uh, I would I imagine I'm pretty close to that thought process. I don't know. I'd love to do a, a view of his shop. I, I once offered Robert Keeley to do a video tour of his shop too as well, and it just didn't didn't happen. But so, you know, um, I'd love to say it's an open invitation to any shop because, uh, you know, I don't know how the expenses get. I don't want somebody to say, like, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in Norway, fly it all the way to Norway to see my shop. I mean, it could get expensive, but I am very open. If any factory, so, and so, you know, it's very hard. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I should probably track this so I can share with you guys because it's probably important to share. I want to say nine, nine out of 10. I feel pretty confident, but I'm going to say 80% now just because I want a little play. Eight out of every 10 factories I've asked to do a video or like what I did at Kiesel, what I've done at PRS, what I've done at GNL, say no. I mean, I could tell you, I mean, all the time. Oh, I want you to just assume that when it comes to guitar, especially when it's made in the USA, that if I've done a video of their guitar, I have asked them if I could do a video of their factory at, on my expense. I've, I've asked uh, Zagger Guitars if I could do a, a video of their shop. I've asked uh, Heritage Guitars. If I could do a video of their shop, I've asked uh, Nags Guitars if I knew a video of their shop. I mean, I ask every anybody I've ever worked with any, to any degree. As you guys know, I'm still working. I'm not getting very far on court guitars, but they didn't say no. The owner of court guitars said he's going to think about it. Uh, you know, and that's a heavy expense, man. This is crazy. I, even my wife's like, are you kidding? You're going to fly to Indonesia? You know how much this is going to cost to go to the factory tour? And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I'm worth it. <laughs> but... um. Uh, so, so there you go. It's like, I, like I said, I, I, I really would like to see these places and share them with you guys. And so, you know, um, some places won't let me film there, but if they let me go there, at least like when you get questions, I like knowing instead of guessing, you know, like this, you know, when you ask me a question, like, how do they do the pedal? I'm like, I don't know how they do the pedals, but if I've been there, I can share, even if it's not a video, I can just tell you. 
You're like, oh, that's how they do it. Um, by the way, Daddario uh, invited me to their factory, but told me I couldn't film anything. And um, I'm still going to do it, but I, I'm because I can't film anything and it's just going to be an experience thing that I can relate to you verbally, um, I want to be on that side of the country. So we'll work out something one day where I'm when I'm there, I'm going to. I'll hit them up so we can go. But I, I just couldn't justify flying out to go there just so that maybe one day if you guys ask me a question about Didario strings, I can answer it. It just seemed like a lot of expense for a potential question. Um, okay. Um, T-Size says, hey, Phil, if given the opportunity between a Fender Ultra Strat Vintage 261, Vintage 257, RPS Silver Sky, what would you choose and why? Um, vintage 61 Strat is what I would pick. Um, why? Because that's what I have. <laughs> uh, I, I've had all those guitars. Uh, it's some iteration of them. Okay. So I've had both the Silver Sky. I've had two core Silver Skies and I've had one SE Silver Sky. Um, they were fantastic guitars. And anyone who says like, hey, that's, that's my favorite guitar in the world, I can totally see why because it was a great instrument. Um, the Ultra Strat, I've totally had the Ultra Strat in different iterations and it's a great guitar and, uh, the 57, same thing. Uh, I like it, but for some reason, the vintage sixties era strats, um, are my faves. I like the neck carve and I'm really convinced after doing hundreds and hundreds of deep dives, those sixties era strat carves are literally those neck carves are where most manufacturers, um, do their necks. Cause I've told you guys this before the, the fretboard is so easy. You, you know, when you have a new company and you're a new company and you go, and we're going to build guitars and they go, what, what radius fretboard? And they go 12, <laughs> what radius fretboard? 16, you know, right. Uh, nine and a half. They just, you know, they just know. But when you ask like, well, what should our neck feel like? They very rarely go, Oh, I know exactly. I'm going to carve it out of clay. And this was going to feel like they go, I once had, it always start. I uh, just trust me on this. It's like, uh, most of the time it says, I once had a guitar, blah, blah, blah. And I, I feel like a lot of players, man, especially the age group, because you got to think about the guitar world that we live in. You have all these players that discovered rock and roll and blues, and they, a lot of them discovered it through Fenders, and the 50s Fenders were chunky necks. And when they got those 60s necks, a lot of players were like, man, you know, wow. You know, if they had played their, you know, this big chunky Gibson neck, this big chunky Fender neck, the first time they got that 60s neck, you know, and in my, again, in my, my opinion, it kept going and then it gets to the Ivan is wizard necks and stuff. And I think a lot of players, although there's players out there that love that and, and who doesn't love that? Um, yeah, the, the, I don't know who doesn't love that. The, the players love that. That's too far for most players. They're like, that's too damn thin. It's Goldilocks, right? That the, the, the Ivan is necks are too thin and the, the fifties necks are too chunky. And so I, I, and I didn't just come up with this theory and then execute on it. It's just from, you know, sh checking all these necks. You just see so many manufacturers have kind of just found that. And then I go, when I ask myself, why, why do so many necks that I review fall in line with sixties era fenders so much, right? And there's a couple different sixties era fenders. And that's what I'm saying. There's, there's, they, they fall all of them, right? There's different ones, but they, they follow all of them at some point. And then if you really think of it the way I did, which is yeah, it's because a lot of players really found that that was the first time like, yeah, this is way better than that chunky neck. And then like I said, the 80s necks got a little like, ah, you know, unless you're a virtuoso, those those 80s era necks that are thin, they don't feel that great. I, I always refer, and, I, and, I, and so I, I don't offend anybody. I love my Ibanez guitars, but I, I tell people all the time, I tell my friends, it's like playing a saltine cracker. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, it's, 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 it's intense. It's thin. So, uh, there you go. Uh, oh, somebody said, hey, Ivan is ne next to give you carpal tunnel. You know, what's funny is this is, uh, this is why I want to read that. Uh, that was uh, trip tippy trippy trippy 325 says Ivan is next equal carpal tunnel. The wrong neck for you. Yes. Um, the, uh, the Ivan is next to the player that's in that position, you know, that's doing those scales up and down, uh, those necks are very good for their hands. In fact, probably help their hands. But for us, you know, cowboy chord players, us bar chord players, us traditional pentatonic players, yeah, those necks get a little like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like my hands cramping a little bit. Um, and, 
And I've gotten worse over the years. The older I've got, the more, like I said, Goldilocks I've got. The next too thick, I'm playing and my hand hurts. And the next too thin, I'm playing and my hand hurts. It's like, sucks. Don't get old. I don't recommend it. No, actually, I recommend it over the other thing, but it still don't. It's not great. All right. It says HK says, hey, Phil, do you know of any 12-string electro, electric acoustics with slightly thinner body than a dreadnought, which I already have, uh, which I already have uh, another chance dreadnought? Um, I don't know of any. I mean, there's tons, but I don't know any specifically. When I think of a thin line uh, acoustic uh, 12 string, I would imagine the brands to probably take notice to would be Ibanez and Breedlove. I, I kind of picture that. That would be where I would kind of look. There you go. Um, but but I'll pop around. Maybe you know. Maybe that's a good video to do. I don't know. Maybe I need to do a video of thin line acoustic, 12 string acoustics. Um, Okay, so Torrance uh, Performance uh, gave us a follow-up. He says, I had had a check on the Orms B on low gain there. Humbucker position just drops dramatically and loses all power. Signal coil sounds great. So does that mean it's fixed? Wait, let me read this again. He goes, okay, had had a check on the Orms B. Okay, so he's checked it on the lower gain, which as I suggested earlier. He says, the humbucker position just drops dramatically and loses all power. Signal coil sounds great, question mark. So it's still doing it? Is this the same question as before? Are we hitting a follow-up? I, th I think I think I read his question earlier and now I'm just rereading the same question. That's what happens when you go two hours on the show. I think that's what happened. I'm, I thought it was a follow-up. I was so excited. I was like, oh, did we get a follow-up to that question? And I'm not reading again. Okay, let's uh, let's finish up the show. Let's do that since obviously I'm, I'm having moments. <laughs> Let's do those. I got three quick ones for quick. Uh, I think it's Tister. Tister says, grateful for the knowledge and the co uh, consistency. Thank you. Uh, you know, hey, look, I'm just, I'm happy we get to all hang out. Okay. Um, but I appreciate the kind words, man. Who doesn't want to hear nice stuff? Uh, Tom says, time for Friday fun. He's got the beer fun. Cheers. I haven't been drinking beer. Uh, I've uh, been walk watching my figure. <laughs> I am, I think I told you guys I'm officially under my COVID weight. So I, I went from fat to really COVID fat to back down. I'm back down to fat now. I'm regular fat, not COVID fat anymore. So I weigh, I weigh what I weigh, what I weigh. Uh, I weigh exactly, well, a pound or two lighter. So, but that's not a brag, is it? Oh, two pounds. Uh, I'm a pound or two lighter than I was when COVID started. Because apparently when COVID started, beers and donuts were not the best decision. I think, I, I don't know if I told you guys, I'll share this with you guys. I share this because... It was such a traumatic time for all of us and and not to bring it all back up, but it's important that we we learn from it and go from it. And and maybe you were better than me. Some of my friends went to the gym and got Ralph lost weight and got buff during COVID bastard. But anyways, the rest, my other friends and me, we just got fatter and dumber. So um, <laughs> uh, I gained I figured this out. This is this is what I figured out. I gained 24 pounds during COVID, give or take. When I say give or take, it's really, I'm give, I'm rounding up. It was like 22 pounds. But basically, I gained a pound a month during COVID. Slowly just packed it on. And it was beer and donuts. I, I went, That's such a Homer Simpson, Simpson stu stupid thing to say. But my kids, were, which are both be bean poles, uh, just discovered that you could get a Bosa of donuts delivered to the house at 8 o'clock at night. And when, they can't eat it. They're two bean poles. They couldn't eat a dozen donuts. So, of course, there's like donuts left. And I'm like, I had three beers. And after three beers, a donut's just a great decision. So, anyways, that's what I did. And so, obviously, uh, after COVID, so I'm, I didn't do this recently. I, I've, 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 I've now actually lost, so, you know, uh, almost 30 pounds. But, but like I said, I, I want to get the COVID weight off and then keep going. So, I've been going that way. Uh, no diet, nothing like that. Um, uh, when I say don't diet, it's just uh, I go for walks. I walk everywhere. I, if I want food, I have to walk for it. <laughs> That's basically it. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, there you go. There, uh, That's what I'm sharing with you guys. Okay, so... Um, uh, okay, so Chris has an update. That's what I'm seeing. Okay, so Chris has an update on the foam and the LTD issue. He says, pulled the foam out under the pickup on the LTD and only slightly lowered the pickup. The screw on the low E... Uh, just keeps spinning in the wood. That happens. Don't worry about that. When trying to lower it, it's stripped and not just lowering. That's okay. You can fix that right now, buddy. Um, a toothpick. 
So what I want you to do, if you have type on wood glue or Elmer's glue, just a, a water-based glue, no super glues, no epoxies, you know, right? Um, keep it wood-based glue. If you don't have glue, you're fine. What I want you to do, pull the pickup back out, okay? Um, take the toothpick, shove the toothpick in the hole and break it off or, or figure out how deep it is and cut the toothpick in so it's just, you know, the, the height of the hole. Um, if you have a tack pin, I have a video on this where I say take a tack pin and poke a hole in the center of the toothpick. That way the screw goes in the center of the toothpick. But if not, you'll be fine. And put the same screw back, man. You're fine. And if you do have some wood glue, um, I stick the toothpick when it's long. Stick the toothpick in wood glue for a second. And then I just wipe the glue off. Not all of it off, but just like the majority off so it doesn't get you know gummy and weird. And and, and they do it. I let it sit for a second and let the, the toothpick kind of soak the, the glue a little bit. And stick it in there. It's just going to really make it uh, happy. But uh, it's going to make it happy. I don't know what the hell I'm saying. Told you two hours is tough after a while. Yeah, glue makes toothpicks happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to it's going to work efficiently, but like I said, just use a toothpick, man. And if you don't have a toothpick, um, go to steak dinner tonight, and they give them to you free at the end of the meal. <laughs> so the, I think Denny's does too. You could go to Denny's, but anyway, anyways, um, that's what I would. Uh, that's you're fine. So like I said, don't worry about the stripping the screw out and stuff. That's that happens a million times every day to, I mean, by the guitar's design, it's almost like they were asking for it when they did that. Just think about removing pick guards and removing all this stuff. I mean, there's, there's a, uh, there's probably not a guitar on the planet earth that's 20 years old that doesn't have toothpicks shoved in it somewhere. So there you go. Um, uh, okay. So let's do some fun stuff. Well, I'm going to consider this the end of the show. Uh, Right. I just want to make sure if I missed a comment, I know Amanda penned a bunch for me that I didn't get to, but Amanda, I'm going to hit all those next week. Thank you for those. I'm going to have them all ready to go. Um, but a, a, a couple questions. I got a, a question I see here that was cool uh, that uh, somebody asked, when's the um, Emerald guitar video coming? Uh, it's coming. Uh, I was just like, I guess when I can actually see. I have my schedule when editing and because some stuff is filming and some stuff is editing. Okay. So I can't, I'm not going to tell you when I'm going to tell you wh what, uh, guitars are coming. So there is an Emerald guitar video, acoustic video that's on its way. Uh, when I say it's on its way, this is all before it's February 29th. So these are the videos by the end of the month. I never did this before. I thought it'd be fun to do this. I used to be afraid to tell you guys this stuff because I would jinx it. And then the videos wouldn't get done. You get mad at me, but with the new efficient studio, um, some of the stuff's already filmed and it just needs to be edited and some of the stuff needs to be filmed, but it's uh, the process. So Emerald Guitars, before the end of the month, Emerald Guitars, GFS uh, sent out a guitar. Um, I believe I saw uh, Guitar Max or Max Guitar. I, maybe I'm dyslexic, I don't know. I think it's Max Guitar. Uh, it, uh, uh, he just posted some, that uh, he's got the same guitars. So that, really cool. Uh, a lot of you guys have been asking about those guitars. Um, I think because of you guys, they reached out and said, hey, can we send you one? So that's that's happening. Uh, I have a new amp. I'm not going to say the name of the amp, but it's a cool little amp. Um, I have a Michael Kelly guitar. That's right, because Michael Kelly sent out a guitar. That's really cool. I have a, a really amazing, I'm not going to say the brand name, a really amazing Italian-made guitar that I'm excited about. Um, that's before the end of the month. And I have and another brand I'm not going to say because I have a video that's coming that... Uh, it's been really stressful for me because it's um, it's a deep dive on a guitar that is did that did not do well, and um, uh, you know, and the company sent it, so I don't think they're gonna be happy with me. But you know, it's you gotta give the news the way you see it, right? So, uh, so there's a video coming that you know, the guitar didn't do well. There's um, I thought there were some others too. Am I looking behind me? What do I got? Oh, uh, on a personal note, um, I'm going to be doing a video of my new Godan nylon. I, we talked about that last week that I ordered that and it said it was used, but it, I, I suspect it was new and it came in and guess what? It was brand freaking new. So it's a beautiful guitar. I'm going to do a video of it. I know what you're thinking. Um, you know, you've seen the Multiac uh, Godin guitars before, but believe it or not, there are a couple different ones and this is not the common one. This is the most uncommon one. So I thought this would be a great deep dive guitar to explain why I chose it. And this guitar had a small issue uh, that had to be corrected. And I think it's a fun educational thing of how I corrected the issue and uh, what was the issue, right? It was not cosmetic. It's because guitar, like I said, the guitar is fine, but setup wise, it needed some help. And then Susan says the Firebird, the Firebird, is now a priority. It will not be in February. The Firebird, though, will be 
in the very beginning of March. It's, I know my wife's watching this right now. She's probably going, oh, him and his promises. But I, I, I said it, so it's going to get done. So it, it gets done. Okay, there you go. I hope that was, I hope that was a fun show. Um, all right, thank you for everyone that hung out. Thank you for everybody who watches the show. Congratulations to the winners of the bell tone guitar and the orange wood acoustic uh, with the Fisherman pickup and the um, the uh, Snark tuner. And thank you guys for supporting the channel in the 350 episodes. That was, like I said, it was pretty pretty cool. We'll do some more giveaways. We have some more guitar giveaways coming. Uh, I try to space them out because, like I said, the companies a lot of times are kind enough to send the guitars, which is awesome, but we pay the shipping and stuff. And so, like I said, we like to parcel out each month like as an expense. It's not a huge expense, but, you know, a couple hundred bucks a month, you're kind of like, let's just fill that fill that out every month, right? Just kind of do it that way. Um, so that's why we, we pace out the giveaways like that. Just kind of keep it, keep it easy that way. Um, all right, and on that note, I'm going to let you guys go. And uh, until the next time, know your gear. Before you spend your rent, car payment, or child's inheritance on gear, please use the affiliate links down below.